25-15 route tonight as Colorado crushes the wind chill. It was a wake-up call for us. It was a learning opportunity, and obviously we responded in a big Duna way. Biles there, but Vanelka skies him and shows it off. I'm proud of how we came out the gate, starting with energy and finishing it through the whole game. Matty Jackson leaping into the end zone. Colorado is cruising right now. This is real competition from out of state, real competition from out of division. Welcome back. It's Swing Pass Week 8 preview time. We're officially past the midway point of the 2024 UFA regular season, and it feels like a real show-me weekend coming up in the UFA. Colorado really takes center stage once again as they face another tough two-game road trip, but this time interdivisionally as they start in Madison on Friday night in the game of the week against the Radicals at Bree Stevens Field before facing off on Saturday night against the reigning Central Division champion, Minnesota Windchill at Seafoam Stadium. That is a rematch of the first ever meeting between the Summit and Windchill last year that Colorado won by 10 goals, but this one figures to be a completely different matchup between the two teams. Minnesota looking to be full strength, while Colorado will notably be down several starters. There are 12 games in total, and we will get to the other 10 matchups, but Cam and I really wanted to kind of lump that into a section we wanted to talk about in terms of who stands the most to gain from a potential win in Week 8 and which teams stand to lose the most should they drop a game or two. Cam, I want to bring you in because you guys are coming off of a couple tough losses yourself. This feels like one of those weekends where we really separate the wheat from the chaff in this league and we get a sense of who's going to be the contenders as we roll towards the playoffs and whose seasons might start kind of waning in these last six weeks of the regular season. Yeah, and every division feels a little bit different because uh, just the dynamics within that division and what the team's records are so far. Um, we've been calling it the middle of the season for a while now, but it's not until after this weekend that every team officially will be at least halfway through their schedule. Uh, there's still a number of teams, including us, who have only played five games. Um, so all of all the teams in the league will be passed, uh, you know, six or more games after this weekend, and. Let me tell you, each division's got kind of their own little win meta going on right now. Uh, and that definitely affects things. Uh, for instance, we were just talking in the pre-show. In the West, it looks like you might have to get to seven or maybe almost even eight wins to even guarantee a playoff spot, which is a little bit on the high side. Uh, then you look in the Central where it's just a complete mess. And it looks like if you just get to 500, you're going to have a chance to maybe throw your hat in the playoff ring. So every every division feels a little bit different right now. Uh, but I got to say, I don't think we've ever been at the midpoint of a season before with this much up in the air about who might or might not make the playoffs. And while there might be a little bit of a lacking in terms of primetime matchups, especially compared to the last two weekends of play, I feel like this weekend will be just as important in terms of results because of, like you say, just the uncertainty throughout the divisions. The margins are so small this year with there being just one undefeated team remaining in Carolina that every team can potentially improve their stock within any given standings with any kind of win. I mean, you look at Philadelphia and Los Angeles, which we'll probably talk about later in this episode, they both sit at one and five, but... They're the kind of teams that play with such emotion on their sleeves that any sort of win could really spark their season. They're both playing interdivisional or excuse me, divisional rivals in New York for Philadelphia and then San Diego for LA. And you know, coming off of those potential wins, they could really surge in the standings. On the flip side, a loss basically is a coffin nail for both franchises. Yeah, and you know, we've talked about I think in preview before the season started, like where Philly might end up, where LA might end up. And you're right. Like, I think if you get to six losses for either one of those teams, uh, 500 is not good enough in either of those divisions, I don't think, to make the playoffs. So even if they ran the table after that, getting to six wins isn't quite enough. 
they're literally in do or die mode uh, already. Uh, every game's a playoff game at this point, um, which is crazy uh, thinking about where we had these teams in the preseason and we thought both of them were punchy. Both of them could definitely compete for a third playoff spot. Uh, here we are halfway through their seasons and uh, the playoffs are almost out of reach. And on the flip side of that, you have teams like Seattle, uh, even Montreal and Houston kind of really taking advantage of the chaos and putting themselves into favorable favorable positions, excuse me, as we head into the back half of their schedules. And I mean, Seattle, almost more so than Colorado, is really going to be watching these interdivisional matchups in the Central Division as the Summit again faced the Radicals and the Windchill, which we'll get to in a moment. But Seattle sitting at six and two, they go to face one and five Portland this weekend. They've dominated that matchup over the past season or so. And man, they could be seven and two after week eight. I mean, I know we looked at this Cascades roster coming into 2024 and saw a lot of upside, but to have that kind of separation in the standings as Colorado faces the very real possibility of exiting this weekend with either four or five losses already I mean, it's just kind of a complete inversion of, I think, the expectations that we had in very realistic terms at this point in the season. Well, I mean, you look at the Cascade schedule and you look at the Oakland Spiders schedule, they're both a little more favorable than what Colorado has to deal with. Um, Seattle's got two games against Portland left. And, you know, Portland did just is coming off their first win of the season, which congrats to them. Um, they, They are showing some fight and some punch. Um, but Seattle has looked really good this year, and I, I I would find it hard to believe that they, you know, don't find a way to win it, at least one, but probably both of those games. I mean, that puts them at eight wins. And, you know, for Colorado to get to eight wins, they'd have to win six out of their final seven games. And that's that's a tall task, especially given, like you said, this weekend they have coming up. Um, Oakland themselves, Oakland's schedule. Also, they have no more games against Colorado or Salt Lake. They've got three San Diego games, two LA games, a Portland game. They could very well find themselves with eight wins on this season too. So I kind of looking at what Colorado has coming up and they're not quite to, you have to win every game territory, but I, I don't know if they can afford to drop more than maybe one game throughout the rest of the season. No, I totally agree with you. And to your points about Seattle and Oakland, I think it's a terrific chance for both of those franchises to really prove it, right? Like these are Mm -hmm. winnable games and these are sort of teams that have fumbled similar opportunities in the past. I mean, you talk about the Spiders, they were seven and three heading into the final weekend of the regular season in 2023, complete control of their playoff destiny. And they dropped both games in the waning moments against divisional rivals and bounced themselves out of playoff contention. So they've kind of been in this position relatively recently in their team's history. Be interesting to see if they can get that monkey off their back. And then with the Cascades, I mean, this is unprecedented for them in terms of just win percentage and where they're at in the standings. Even in 2016, when they made it all the way to the championship game, had that incredible semifinals comeback win over the radicals at Bree stevens field an all-time classic like even that team was kind of marginal in the regular season i think they finished the regular season eight and six it was a 14 game slate back then and they Mm -hmm. just kind of you know edged their way into that final playoff spot in a contentious west division and this is something different you know the 2024 skates They're blowing teams out at home right now. They're averaging 25 per game at Memorial Stadium. They just waxed LA in the back half of last weekend's matchup. You know, it'll be interesting to see, though, if they can do this against winning teams. I mean, I wrote about it. I'm writing about it, I should say, in this week's power rankings. But save for their win against 1-0 Oakland on the first weekend of May earlier this season, the Cascades have not beaten a team with a winning wet record since 2021. And so, you know, there's yep. all this impressive sort of results in, in the box score, but I think they have a little bit more room to show what they're capable of. No, I totally agree. They, they had a pretty good showing in Colorado on Colorado's home opener. And that was on the second day of a back to back, but they didn't win. And, it, and, even, and even if they did, uh, based on the standings right now, it wouldn't be against a team with a winning record. So um, they they look punchy enough. 
I, I think they definitely can. I'll be really interested to see when we get later in the schedule when they, they do have uh, back, uh, back-to-back games against Colorado and Salt Lake. Different weekends, but it's two games in a row for them, um, which are actually three weeks apart uh, as they have a kind of a weird break in their schedule. But yeah, I don't know. Things are really weird out West. Um, this definitely isn't where we expected everyone to be. Um, and I think, like you said, it's a good point. Uh, Oakland is in a really good position, but they have to go out and do it. They have three games against San Diego and San Diego is only two and four, but they have been really close in a couple of these games. They gave Salt Lake um, a pretty good game uh, when they went and visited San Diego. I do think that San Diego, believe it or not, sitting at two and four, I don't quite want to say that they don't have a chance yet. They, they have looked very punchy. I could easily see them somehow getting to, you know, six wins as well. Uh, and so those three games against San Diego are, are not going to be easy. And San Diego, if memory serves, that was the team that eliminated Oakland from the playoffs on that final game last year, right? Oh, yeah, they did. Steven Milardovich so, to tra- or excuse me, Travis Dunn to Steven Milardovich to close out a, a very, I think, difficult season for the Growlers with a high note. Yeah, they they are they they are punchy enough that they could t- they could not just take a game off of Oakland. I mean, I think all three of those games are going to be close games that Oakland's going to have to find a way to win if they want to, you know, secure a playoff spot. But let's like, I want to use this as a launching off point because you mentioned the doubleheader weekend for Colorado. I think the, that's the headline of the weekend are going to be those two games. They're going to be in Bree Stevens field on Friday night. Um, and the last time they were there, they were getting absolutely handled by the Chicago Union uh, in at championship weekend. Um, and now they're making this doubleheader weekend. You mentioned with some notable absences. So I, I have the roster pulled up right now. No Jonathan Nethercut, uh, no Matthew Ag, um, and amongst others, no what? No Alex Tatum, Quinn Finer still not playing. Um, so there are some really intriguing absences that I do wonder how they're going to handle, especially on the second day at Seafoam Stadium where it's always windy. You always need your throwing talent available. Seems a little bit treacherous. Yeah, I mean, so let's get right into it. Game of the week, Friday night. Uh, Colorado at Madison. I'm Watch UFA TV. This is the first ever meeting between the two teams. Colorado enters two and three. Madison at four and two, but that's a little bit of a Potemkin four and two, I feel like. Three of those wins have come against the winless and hapless Detroit Mechanics. And so it this is a pretty big feel out game for both franchises. Neither one I feel like can really take a loss here. Madison is still trying to cobble together their identity at home after having a losing record at Bree Stevens over the past couple seasons. And like we've mentioned in the past two episodes on this here show, Colorado is just at a precipice point in their season where they really can't afford to lose any more games, given their playoff intentions and given how difficult their schedule is. And to your points, Colorado is going to be down some pretty significant starters. You, uh, I also wanted to mention the rookie Zeke Thorison, who's been a really mm, big yep. insertion on offense for the summit as they've kind of, tried to stabilize with the absence of Finer and his hamstring injury. Uh, But yeah, Colorado is going to be down a lot of notable, I think, throwers, particularly you mentioned Nethercutt and Tatum. Also, Connor Tabor won't be available in this game. Eric Hodling has done some handling on the D-line for Colorado. But I think the thing that was most impressive, and we talked about it in our recap episode just the other day, the thing that was most impressive about Colorado's win last weekend wasn't necessarily their offense. It was their defense's ability to get in the shorts of that seemingly almost impenetrable at times Salt Lake reset handler offense. And I think particularly heading into a matchup against this Radicals O-line, Colorado could find a lot of purchase and leverage having similar kinds of pressure in the backfield because that has been a tremendous place of struggle for Madison over the past couple of seasons. Even Detroit in the first half of the Radicals' last game at home uh, 10 or so days ago now, 
uh, they got an early lead. They were up seven to five in the second quarter because they were finding some disruption and making the radicals turn it over on swings and resets, which has been a real problem area for Madison. And so I'm a little concerned with Colorado's ability to get pressure in that area and Madison's ability to handle it while kind of handling the expectations of their home crowd and wanting to play up in a big time matchup. I'm really nervous about Madison's offense as well. Um, You know, ever since that 2018 season where they had to that point, you know, the cleanest offense, I think of any team in league history, when you look at it just from a conversion standpoint, from a completion percentage standpoint, they just have never really been able to get their offense on track. I, I can't remember if this was online or offline. You mentioned that sometimes like last year, it looked like their O prime line maybe should have just been their O line. They were out there running it better, run the system better than, than, you know, the starters were. And I look, especially at, I just don't know how they generate anything in the deep game against Colorado's defense as well. Like you talk about the handler space and how difficult things are going to be there. I don't know how they get any sort of deep game going. They don't have any like big targets to throw to, or at least that they regularly throw to. Gutowski is their is their deep guy. He's not very big. I don't see him having a ton of success in the deep space against the Colorado defenders. And I feel like we're in the games that have not been against Detroit, uh, and especially like you really saw it, I thought, in the Minnesota game, Madison just kind of struggles to connect the backfield to like the like that middle of the field area. It's like they they're either throwing it in the backfield or throwing it deep and they struggle so much to just like move the disc down the field. Uh, and I, I think that could be maybe shown to an even greater extent in this Colorado game, just with the, the athletes, the, the team speed and size that they have on that Colorado defense. Yeah. I, I do want to push back on one area and I'll complicate it a bit. You mentioned that Madison might have some trouble hucking it against the summit defense, but To this point in the season, Madison has been fairly effective in connecting on their deep throws. They sit fifth overall in the league in Huck completion rate. But again, four of their six games have come against defenses that I would probably qualify in the bottom six in the league in Pittsburgh and Detroit. So you've got to take those uh, throwing numbers, I think, with a grain of salt. However, against the two, I would say, better defenses that they played this season in Chicago and Minnesota... Madison did complete 10 plus hucks in both games, but to your point, they sort of felt at times out of system, like they needed to take those Mm -hmm. shots in order to engage some kind of vertical dimension. And it wasn't like they were uh, efficient in other areas in the two games against, again, Chicago and Minnesota defenses, they were right around 50% offensive conversion rate, which is Mm -hmm. middle of the pack, if not a little bit below. And so, yeah, I I think there's sort of cases for both sides of Madison's offense. It seems like at times it has a little bit more of a top end than it's had in recent history. But by the same token, there isn't really much more efficiency here. There's not necessarily much more production for the, the purchase price, right? Yeah, and, you know, they're one of the bottom teams in the league in completion percentage, uh, what, fourth from the bottom, uh, sitting at 91%, which is not great. Um, I just, if they can't string together these points, they're going to have to string together points where they're making, you know, 15, 20 throws. So can they do that? Well, from a completion percentage standpoint, the answer seems to be no, like they're not going to be able to consistently do that. And I don't think they're going to have a lot of these points where they're scoring in like five to seven throws. It's going to have to be working the disc down the field, resetting it, moving, switching attack points and, you know, striking up field then. And that that's where I think Madison is going to struggle. Now they'll have the home crowd behind them, which hasn't actually necessarily, as you mentioned, been the most helpful recently at home. They actually do have a le- losing record over the last few seasons, but um, uh, maybe with the travel and some players missing, maybe they can take advantage of a Colorado lineup that's a little bit depleted. Um, but it, it's going to be tough. Like Madison's going to have to play their best game of the season to come out on top of this one. So, uh, 
I, I think that's about all they can hope for. One question I've been asking myself since the rosters became active and we could see who was missing from the Summits lineup. Obviously, they're going to miss Nethercut and Tatum and some of their starters that are gone. There's no question there. But given how we've seen the Summit struggle so far in 2024, I wonder if this makes them focus in the same way that they looked focused in that second half against Salt Lake last weekend. Like we've talked ad nauseum about how talented this Summit team is. Yet that doesn't always equate to some kind of su- success for them, excuse me. So I kind of wonder if this back against the wall, not our ideal roster is almost an optimal place mentally for this Colorado team to succeed. I mean, you could just, again, see it in how it, Mike Lund, the head coach, referred to it in the Tuesday toss this past weekend, how the team Felt like they bonded for the first time all season. Obviously, as he even mentioned, the win helps. It always is good to win. (laughs) Everything can kind of be ameliorated through winning in sports oftentimes. But you could see them relax a little bit and play more up to what they're capable. And I feel like that's a little bit of trouble for a central division who hasn't always handled out of division competition. Well, Madison has struggled at Bree Stevens when they've held these interdivisional regular season matchups in the past. Historically, I think back to 2017 with Dallas, 2018 with Carolina. Uh, And on the flip side, Colorado still has players like Alex Atkins and Jay Frood, uh, another former radical uh, in Logan Pruis. You know, they have players who like taking on the challenge of an away game of playing as kind of a heel against opposing fans and so I wonder what it's like if Colorado can kind of get an early lead that hasn't necessarily been what they've been good at this season they've had slow starts in almost every game but with them coming off of that almost season changing win in Salt Lake I could see them having kind of a focus with this more limited lineup I will see if that holds into their second game on Saturday night as they face one of the top defenses in Minnesota But on Friday night against Madison, Colorado has a confidence in being able to kind of show up and kind of punch up out of, I think, a detrimental area. Whereas Madison still is a little bit looking for something to really confirm that they're back. Yeah, like Madison could really show me something by showing up in this game. But to your point about the summer roster, I guess I would say that, like, I don't know if I believe in this all back against the wall, not not ideal roster thing because we saw when they hosted Salt Lake, who was on the back day of a doubleheader without, um, without Nethercut, we saw what happened to the offense. Then Noah Coolman and Alex Atkins just decided that they were going to, uh, what they combined for like 15 turnovers. Uh, I feel like Nethercut was so central to their performances this weekend too. He, he played really well. I thought in both games, he, he, he had that, top that play on the top 10 where he threw a standstill 80 yard huck for a score uh and you know they, they just don't having a weapon like that having someone that you constantly have to worry about like that is i think so important and changes the way that every team has to respect every cut on the field i think it will really show up on the second day when they're playing in that really windy seafoam stadium and they just need someone who can be back there to complete p- passes consistently I don't know. Uh, I need to see them perform offensively without another cut on the field because the small sample size we have was was not good. Um, I think they can find a lot of success offensively if they just just rely on the fact that people are going to be open. Like they're going to have people open in the middle of the field. They're going to have easier throws. They don't need to try anything super impressive they don't need to try anything that's going to show up on a highlight reel like they can just matriculate the disc down the field uh if they do that on offense i i think they'll be fine if we see something like what we did in the salt lake game where a couple mistakes happen and i'm talking about their first salt lake game where a couple of mistakes happen and they just kind of let a snowball on them after that that's where i could see them getting into trouble but i'm, I'm hoping after one instance of that happening kind of cooler heads will prevail and you know any obstacles that come up throughout the course of the game, they can just kind of handle them and move on and, and, you know, just rely on, on their play. I mean, they have great players. They just got to rely on their players and just trust each other and make, make the next throw. Um, 
but I kind of want to transition out of this into the Minnesota game because I am really worried about Colorado going into that Minnesota game. Like second day of a doubleheader, long they just, travel. Like, from- hold on. They just what? they just took on the like greatest challenge of second day of a doubleheader coming off of an emotional last second with, loss like with Nethercut in a game where they're emotionally way more invested than they're going to be in this Minnesota team. Let's be real, like the Salt Lake game like as far as the regular season goes, that's their Super Bowl, right? Like they want to win in Salt Lake. You're ta- telling me long travel to the Midwest having to play Friday night and Bree Stevens and Saturday night against a team that they took, they handled pretty easily last year in Colorado. You're going to tell me that you, they're going to go in with the same amount of like emotionality and like, they're going to be up for that game the same way they were for the Salt Lake game. Yes. I don't believe it. <laughs> that is what I'm going to say. I think that given the fact that they're going to be down the kind of calming presences of Nethercut, Tatum, et cetera. And instead it's going to be the Atkins and Kuhlman show. I think the ability to punch down on interdivisional competition presents an immense amount of uh, challenge and opportunity for this Colorado team that when it's up, they love to be up and they love to showboat. I mean, where do you think Salt Lake kind of learned its attitude from over the past couple <laughs> seasons other than taking some beat down losses against a very talented summer team? I mean, I'm thinking back to the first time Salt Lake played at Salt, or excuse me, Colorado played at Salt Lake in 2022, and Alex Atkins and Jay Fruit were pounding their chests and doing show spikes all over the the shred faithful. Um, so yeah, I, I you know I I totally hear what you're saying, and I don't disagree with any of it. I do think that the Salt Lake game holds a particular kind of importance for Colorado and both franchises, frankly, but. I think that last year's 10-goal win over Minnesota kind of showed the similar edge that Colorado has against competition that they think they're better than. And I do think that the Summit will approach this weekend with the mindset of, even if we're down another cut and a host of starters, these are still our matchups to win. We still like basically every one-on-one on either lineup we can throw at these teams. We don't really respect what these Central Division teams have done so far. Well, I guess on the flip side, I would say, should the Central Division teams respect anything other than the one this one win that they've had? I mean, this, this Colorado team's so up and down, and you mentioned the Kuhlman and Atkins show. I don't want to see the Kuhlman and Atkins show. I think that's the <laughs> bad news for Summit, because when they tried to do the Kuhlman and Atkins show in that first Salt Lake game, it, it turned into a show, all right, but it wasn't the type of show that the Colorado fans wanted to watch. So I, I don't. I just. I just fear for Colorado in that second game. I don't think it's like I'm not saying they're going to go in there and lose. I'm not saying like anything like that's guaranteed. It's just like. I don't know where they get the production from in a game that's it's going to have a lot of turnovers. Like Minnesota is as good at stopping your initiation plays and mucking things up offensively for you as any team. They're going to be playing like I, I that stadium is always up pretty upwind downwind. And, you know, you, you don't really get calm days there. Uh, I just, I, I think this game's going to be rock. It's going to be rocky. Like there's going to be, we're going to see something probably in the neighborhood of like 35 to 40 turnovers combined. If I had to guess, I'm just going to throw that out there now as a general guess, it's going to be similar to that Oakland game that from this past weekend where both teams are going to be turning the disc over. And it's just going to be like, it probably is going to come down to kind of like who has the last opportunity or who scores late in the fourth quarter. Um, Especially with Colorado coming off of back to back days. I think they can do themselves a lot of favors by maybe getting getting a lead in that Madison game and maybe being able to put it on cruise a little bit. But here's what I'm really hoping for. I want to see Alex Atkins make a play at the end of the fourth quarter again. I want to see the quadruple spike. I think we're ready for it. I want four spikes of the disc at the end of that game. I just don't know where this complete confidence in Minnesota at home has come from, given that the last game that they played there, they got pretty brutally upset by the Thunderbirds to the point where the Thunderbirds were even clipping uh, segments of this show out of you and posting it on their social media. So I kind of feel like the windchill are in a similar category as Oakland and that they have a little bit of prove it in these bigger games. You know, their, their impressive semifinal performance against Salt Lake last year 
still L ended in an L. Uh, they haven't really won against out of division opponents super well over the history of their team. I mean, I'm even thinking back when they had some weird uh, matchups against Seattle way back in the day when it looked like the Windchill were a much better team and then they'd go up and lose at Memorial Stadium. Uh, I remember that game. Yeah. And I, the thing about them, and it's the same thing that Colorado's doing this weekend, right, is they traveled super poorly to both of those games. They were missing, I remember that Seattle game, they were missing a host of starters in that one. We've talked before about going out to Colorado, missing essentially a full starting seven almost of guys, also with Abe Coffin first game back from injury, who looked like he just should not have been out on the field yet. And you know, you're, you're getting a Minnesota team who's been down so many of their players. They finally basically had everyone this past weekend in Indianapolis. Um, you know, Will Brandt is back. Paul Krennic is back. Uh, I th- they, they've they got these guys back in their lineups, and they're kind of at full strength. Um, and that's kind of where, I mean, that makes a big difference, right, for – I think especially a team like Minnesota, teams, I'll just go ahead and say it, teams in the Central Division, the depth that you see in like a Carolina or even like a Colorado or some of these other teams that we think are like these upper echelon, like top of the league type teams, absences mean so much more to teams in the Central because I don't think there's a team in the Central that really goes, can say they run 30 deep, right? Like, you could almost take any combination of 20, uh, you know, within reason from like Carolina and they're going to have a chance to win pretty much every game they're in. And I, I just don't think that's the case with with basically anyone in the Central Division. You need as many of your top guys as you can possibly have. And we've seen over the years some weird results in the Central. And a lot of times it comes down to just missing like maybe just two players. But those two players might be vitally important to that team in a way that I don't know if it always hits some of these other teams, like even Colorado, right? Like I'm sitting here talking about nether cut being missing, which I do think is humongous for them, but like they have so many capable players across their roster that like, it's not like they're putting some guy in there that doesn't belong on the field, right? Like they, they're putting in a good player. You, you know, nether cuts kind of a one of one. So you're not going to get the same production and the same types of looks with whoever you replace them with, but you are going to get a very good player. Um, and somebody who could go play pretty much anywhere in the league with when you have the type of talent and depth that you do in Colorado. So I kind of wanted to switch to talking very briefly about the differences for Minnesota this year. Again, they suffered that 10 goal loss. We attribute a lot of it to roster absences. I also just think it's mindset. I think Minnesota went into that game coming off of a big win at Madison, kind of one of those border battles that you charge up for and then just inevitably come a little bit down from and having the immediate mountain travel the weekend after, I think just zapped a windshield team in the thick of their schedule in 2023. But in addition to just being at a better place, being a little bit more prepared for this given matchup, I come back once again to Matt Rader being on this windchill roster. And that's just yeah. one of those players who... They didn't have last year. To your point, Abe Coffin was coming back in that matchup against Colorado for the first time in over a month from his hip injury and just did not look like Abe Coffin. And other than that, there wasn't really a presence that could rally against Summit's sort of superstar show of Quinn Finer, Alex Atkins, and company going off. And now this year, with Colorado being down a couple of their stars, and Minnesota being up a little bit in terms of their roster, I I look at Raider as somebody who could just give some matchup fits that Colorado isn't used to experiencing against Minnesota. Yeah, and, you know, Minnesota is down a couple of people this weekend that they would surely like to have. No Quinn Snyder, no Brett Bergmeier. Sam Berglund's still out with an injury. I do think having Matt Raider there is, is huge. I mean, he's huge, first off. He's just... He's still got that that speed and that that burst in the air, uh, and I think you've said before, like, can he do that every single quarter, every single point? I don't know. He he hasn't he hasn't yet. I don't know if that means he can't or he just hasn't needed to yet. Um, but he certainly is capable of. You know, we saw on some deep balls to Brett Holzmeier, Colorado had a lot of trouble, and I think Matt Rader in the air is 
you know, comparable to where we see Brett Holzmeier on any given point, just with, with his size and with the way he able is able to position himself. Um, I mean, the big, the big thing about this game though, that I'm going to be watching, it's going to be watching Colorado's offense versus Minnesota's defense. That's the matchup. If, if Minnesota can cause issues, you know, on a consistent basis for Colorado, uh, Colorado's offense, that, that means pretty good things for Minnesota. But if Colorado's not really struggling against Minnesota's defense, I think we could start to see a game that gets pretty ugly for Minnesota. I think they really have to assert themselves on the defensive side of the disc to come out with a win in this game. Um, and I don't know. We'll see. We'll see what happens. I, I, I'm, I think this game is going to, it is the super series game. I do think it's going to be a great game and it's going to be close throughout. Um, but, uh, and Colorado needs it, you know, Colorado needs this game a lot more than Minnesota does. Like if there's one thing for them to kind of get up for, it's really hard. They're not going to have an emotional high as big as winning in Salt Lake and knocking off an undefeated tread team but they need to find a way to manufacture that emotional response for this game in any way they can possibly do it uh, because they need to be up for this game and they, they really need to come out of this weekend two and oh. So let's just get right into it. Right. I kind of teased it at the beginning of the episode about who stands to gain the most from a win versus who suffers the most from a loss or losses. We can group in the two games that we've just talked about in Colorado's road trip to Madison and Minnesota We've got 10 other matchups on the slate, and I think that there's a lot of interest in those games as well as far as who can improve their stock versus who really stands to tumble out of contention if they don't take care of business in week eight. So I wanted to give the floor to you a little bit, and maybe you can talk about three teams in particular that could most gain from a win in week eight and which three teams would suffer the most from a loss. Sure. Uh, I mean, the first team, as far as gaining, is definitely, uh, I guess, and I guess you can kind of look at two sides of the same coin, um, but gaining, Pittsburgh. Uh, Pittsburgh at Chicago this week. Um, Carl Johnson, I saw, was questionable, um, so we'll see if he makes a return to the lineup, but uh, this this is kind of a show-me game for Pittsburgh. They they had, you know, their last game was against us, and it was their best performance, not just in team history, but the best, best performance in league history during the regular season in terms of offensive efficiency and not turning the disc over. Um, can they repeat it? Can they, like, stick to the small ball and come out with a win? If they do, that'll put them at 4-3, and three, uh, putting them above 500 for the first time this season, uh, give them a real legitimate chance to, like, you know, that would put them up in second place in the division um, should uh, should Madison fall. So I think they have a lot to gain. Um, as far as I'll flip over to losing Colorado. I mean, if they lose either one of these games, they're, they're in pretty rough shape. Like they, they really can't afford maybe more than one loss the whole rest of the season. Uh, if they want to really wrap up a playoff spot. So losing either one of these games, it would be like extremely detrimental to their chances of making the playoffs, which is crazy to say, considering they would only be seven games into their season at the end of this weekend. Um, if you would have told me this before the season, I, I, I would have really struggled to believe you. Um, Houston, this is a weird one because I think, you know, everyone probably in the back of their minds has not worried about who was going to make the playoffs in the South, but rather what seed each team would be. However, with Austin struggles and looking rather non-competitive against playoff teams from last year, if Houston is able to get a win somewhere on their schedule against a non-Dallas team, they could potentially leapfrog Austin by the end of the season into a playoff spot. It's really weird to say that out loud. They have two opportunities this weekend at Atlanta, at Carolina. Um, Real long shot there. <laughs> long shots in those games. I think what they really need to do is find a way to knock off Austin in one of their head-to-head matchups. But if something weird happens and Houston is able to get a win somewhere not against a non-Dallas team, we might be seeing, we could really actually potentially see Houston in the playoffs, which is really weird to say. Um, I think another big one who can gain is Seattle. You know, we mentioned Seattle. Um, 
they do play Portland this weekend. Uh, Portland sitting at the bottom of that division. Um, it's not like this is a big matchup. Seattle definitely favored in this matchup, but getting to seven wins and almost getting to the point where you're guaranteed a playoff spot at that point. I think eight is really the guarantee point right now based on where, where you know, uh, records are. But getting one win closer to eight and kind of locking up a playoff spot, I mean, would be amazing. Like for them to be able to get that much closer to playoff spot, you know, this early in the season um, would be phenomenal for them. And then they can actually work on trying, you know, the one seed's not out of reach yet. I mean, I don't, I don't, I almost said lock up the two seed, but like the one seed is actually still within reach. They have a game against Salt Lake uh, on their schedule. Um, what are the odds? What are the odds? And I'm not a gambling man, so I'm literally asking. <laughs> but what are the odds if I would have said before the season Seattle would have been the first team in the West to seven wins? Man. Uh, You're not oh, just, excuse me, maybe not just the first team in the Central, but in the league, too. Or in the West, sorry, but in the league. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Like I say, I don't, I don't even know where to go with that. There's no exceeding line. expectations and there's upside, and then there's whatever the Cascades are currently doing to take advantage of this topsy turvy standings in the West Division. And two of the three of last year's playoff teams in Los Angeles yeah. and Colorado just having three wins combined as we enter week eight. Well, and the funny thing is, it almost feels like they lost a really good opportunity to already be at seven wins with that home game against Oakland that was so back and forth. So, like, even thinking of it that way, it's like, man, they could already be at seven wins. <laughs> it's just, that is wild. It's difficult, um, though, to do the mental gymnastics of displacing oh, sure. the one-goal wins in the West Division. I think Daniel and I did that one season where we did a little bit of a theoretical episode on what if we flip these game results, and we should definitely do that after this season. But it, you get into some real dark tunnels really quickly with, <laughs> what if you flip this to this? Because... Then yeah. I can start bringing up examples of it almost took overtime for Salt Lake to beat Portland at the beginning of last year on the road. Yep. So there's those kinds of results to talk about in the wild, wild west. But no, I, I think yeah, even, are- uh, I can look back on lots of Alley Cat games where we lost by one goal or, you know, what 2022, I think every close game we had almost, it was like, oh, we, we had a game we could have won, then we lost by a goal. And, you know, that was kind of the story of our season. But that's, um, like, truly the devil's arithmetic is to start doing that kind of math of, like, flipping the results just a little bit. Like, oh, man. Yeah. I have one more. One more. I think you're at five one. now. Yeah, I got, I got one more. You said <laughs> three and three. You said three and three. I got one more. Montreal. They play Sunday against D.C. D.C. has to play at Toronto the day before. Montreal is a team we talked a lot about at the beginning of the season. And due to like some weeks of not playing, we have kind of not really had them high on our, you know, to talk about list. They've only played five games. They're another one of those teams that hasn't reached halfway point of their schedule yet. But they're at two and three. If they find a way to pick off DC on the second day of a back-to-back where they're traveling up to Canada and playing both Canadian teams, that put them at three and three. They would be, you know, up. They would be, what, a half game behind New York at that point? Well, it depends on New York would fare in the road at Philly. Yeah. So they, now they, they lost both games against New York, so they would have to find a way to finish with a better record than by the end of the season. But that would give three teams, sorry, that would give every team in the East outside of Boston three or more losses. And Montreal would have a fighting chance at that point to make the playoffs. I think they lose this week. It becomes really hard for them to make the playoffs. And, and let's, let's be real. Like Montreal is not a team. Like if they were to make the playoffs this year, that'd be way ahead of schedule considering they didn't win a single game last year. But they have been able to punch up with these teams that are at the top of the East and it it's not out of the realm of possibility that hosting DC on the second game of back to back, that they're able to give them a very good fight and potentially win that game. So I think they do have a lot to gain. It keeps them in the playoff hunt and 
that's kind of wild to say six games into their season after after what we witnessed in 2023. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, it's been basically a complete reversal for the Royale from a competition standpoint from their winless 2023 campaign. And particularly if they can, like Seattle, take advantage of some of the divisional chaos that's going on around them, more power to them. Uh, I just want to run through my quick list of three and three for who stands again and who stands to suffer. For my gainers, I've also got Pittsburgh. They sit at three and three. If they can move to four and three and get wins against Minnesota, Indy, and Chicago in division, setting up the back half of their schedule, that just feels like one of the most optimal positions we've seen from Pittsburgh since they were making divisional championship game appearances back in like 2015, 16, and 17. It's been a few years since we've seen them hey, at the level. They also made it. Too. I was going to say they, they made it in 2018 too, but it was a, or no, not 2018, 2019. 2019. <laughs> Don't mess me up now. Uh, <laughs> I said 19. We beat them saying, in that game. I, I remember that game very well. I know, I know. <laughs> But um, no, it's just been a few years since we've seen Pittsburgh at this competition level, and yet they have it in their franchise's history. And so I would like to see them kind of take advantage of the opportunities that they've created for themselves. But I do worry that a bit about them down a couple of their starters and being able to replicate the magic that they had against you guys at home, now on the road against a Chicago team that, no offense to you, Alley Cats, but just has been playing better defensively in 2024 so far. So that would be a big win for Pittsburgh. You mentioned Houston. That is just such a long shot given the competition level of their opponents and how they fared against the Hustle and the Flyers in their previous games. Those have just been traditionally really, really hard matchups. So I don't know about that. I've actually got New York on this list because they sit yeah. at four and three and because if they lose against Philadelphia and there is some speculation to that, given the amount of starters that the empire will be down, it looks like they are once again, signing a couple of one-off contracts, including former Callahan nomination, Jordan Jeffrey way back in the day. I mean, we're really getting to some naming guys in the ultimate history books here. If you bring it on Jordan Jeffrey in the year 2024, but that's where the Empire are, down a few Worlds players with there being an international tournament this weekend. If they lose through three straight games and potentially tie Montreal in the standings in terms of winning percentage, that would just be one of the more tumultuous things along with Seattle that we could have never anticipated really heading into this season. So New York being 5-3 and three as opposed to 4-4 four and four, I think is really big for the Empire franchise. And then in addition to that, I also have Montreal for the aforementioned reasons of New York, as well as what you mentioned. I just think that that turnaround would be remarkable for Montreal getting three wins in their first six games, as opposed to zero and 12 last year speaks for itself. As far as teams that can't afford a loss, uh, I, as I mentioned at the top of the series or episode, excuse me, I'm going to lump in Philadelphia and LA. They both sit at one and five. Getting their six loss in seven games would kind of be a playoff killer for both of those franchises. Um, in addition to that, I've got to say uh, Madison. I think Madison really needs this win against Colorado. I think that they've been a team that has occupied a lot of primetime slots and yet hasn't always fared so well against the level of competition that comes in. And I think with the Summit team down a few starters, this is a terrific opportunity to once again Madison to kind of revitalize and reclaim one of those those potential contender-ish titles that they existed with for so many years back in the day. Um, so I just think Madison can't really afford to lose another game and potentially get into a tie with Pittsburgh for that third and final playoff spot in the Central Division standings. Uh, those are my winners and losers for this weekend. That'll do it for this episode of Swing Pass, concluding the Week 8 preview pod. We'll, we will be back with you in just a couple of days to recap all of the action, but you can watch live on both UFA YouTube for free. That will be the Super Series game on Saturday night between Colorado and Minnesota. All other 11 games will be available live on Watch UFA TV. We will be watching alongside with you, but bye for now. 
This Friday night, the UFA Game of the Week features a never-seen-before matchup as the Colorado Summit travel to Bree Stevens Field to challenge the Madison Radical. Colorado coming off a thrilling road victory over previously undefeated Salt Lake. And the Radicals at 4-2, seeking their own statement win as we enter the second half of the season. So tune in for Colorado and Madison, Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 Central, broadcast exclusively on WatchUFA.tv.